Hello, today is Friday, March 26, 2021. My name is Evan Solis. I'm interviewing Jerry Gonzalez for the Wolses Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin. Please know, Mr. Gonzalez, that this interview will be placed in the Nettie Lee Benson Latin American Collection at UT Austin. If there's anything you do not wish to answer or talk about, I will honor your wishes. Also, if there's something you want to talk about, please bring it up and we'll talk about it. Because we are not conducting this interview in person, I need to record you consenting, so I'll ask you a series of five questions. Please say yes, I agree, or no, I do not agree after each one. There are three questions we need to make sure you agree to before we go on. One, Bosa's wishes to archive your interview along with any other photographs and other documentation at the Benson Library at UT Austin. We will retain copyright of the interview and any other materials you donate to Bosa's. Do you give Bosa's consent to archive your interview and your materials at the Benson Library? I agree. Thank you. Do you grant Bosa's copyright over the interview and any material you provide? Yes, I agree. Thank you. Do you agree to allow us to post this interview on the internet where it may be viewed by people around the world? Yes, I agree. Okay, excellent. Uh, just two more questions. Um, so we have many questions in a pre-interview form that you and I have already filled out. We use that information to help in our research. The entire form is kept in a secure Volsa's server. Before we send it to the Benson Library, we would have stripped out any of the contact information for yourself or your family members. So that would not be part of your public file. Your public file will only be accessible at the Benson Library. Do you wish for us to share the rest of your interview, that is that pre-interview form, in your public file available to researchers at the Benson? Yes, I agree. Thank you. And finally, on occasion, Voices receives requests from journalists who wish to contact our interview subjects. We only deal with legitimate news outlets. Do you give a consent for us to share your phone numbers or your email with journalists? Just the office phone number and just my professional email would be okay. okay. Perfect. Good. We'll make it. We'll keep. We'll make it out of that. All right. Well, thank you, Jerry, for that. Um, so, just to get started, if you wouldn't mind, please just giving us a little bit of background about yourself. So, who you are, where you're from, and and what you do. All right. Uh, my name is Jerry Gonzalez. I am CEO of Galeo, the Georgia Association of Latino Elected Officials, and the Galeo Latino Community Development Fund, and the Galeo Impact Fund, which is a C4 organization. Uh, I was born in Laredo, Texas, in La Frontera, and um, I currently live in Atlanta, Georgia. I have been here for well over 20 years, and Atlanta, Georgia is now home. I still have family back in Texas, um, and uh, I guess that's a good good intro. Yeah, sure, and there's a lot more that we'll, we'll get into there. Um, I want to ask you about your professional career, your trajectory, and some of your personal um, life as well, but before we get into that, since this is for the Voices of a Pandemic Project, I want to start specifically on COVID uh, and the impact of the pandemic on your life over the past year. And the first question I have for you is, was there a moment when you reflect on last year, uh, now, now almost exactly a year ago, um, was there a moment that you remember when you realized that this pandemic was going to be a serious thing, that it was going to have a real impact, something that happened, something that you saw or heard, was there anything like that that you experienced? Uh, I think when it, it um, the moment that really crystallized the, the challenge with the pandemic uh, to us, I think it was really, in particular to me, was when we did get it. Um, we did get COVID uh, in May. Actually, we were diagnosed on Mother's Day last year. And um, at that time, we we've, we've been doing everything we could to to avoid uh, going out in public. Uh, we were been socially distancing. We've been working from home. Uh, we were abiding by the the CDC guidelines on what we one should do and what one shouldn't do. Uh, and that that was that was part of the challenge. Um, I think uh, my husband is a physician. Uh, he treats. He's a he's a pediatric um, doctor. So uh, we're thinking that that's probably the likelihood of how we contracted uh, COVID uh, because of, uh, he was still seeing patients and uh, there was one patient where a patient coughed or something and, and, and he was wearing a mask, but it, it may have gotten in his eye. Uh, so that's, that's really how we think uh, we did get COVID. Uh, but in reality, um, Thinking through that, uh, that's when it really hit home for us that it was really serious. And given at the time that we did get it, we still didn't know a lot about it. Uh, 
this was in May of 2020. We were still learning a lot more about uh, how the virus impacts people, how the virus, uh, we were hearing about the virus impacting people that were healthy and, and uh, they had to be hospitalized, intubated, and some people died that were healthy. You know, so we consider ourselves to be uh, rather healthy, uh, but we were still very, very concerned about the potential impact that it would have on us uh, physically. Um, emotionally, going through that was really, was really nerve wracking because uh, given that we had heard stories of healthy people dying, uh, we, were, we were particularly worried. And we had to have those tough conversations with one another about, um, so this, these are all my passwords for work. If you need to get into anything at work for if, if I get hospitalized, if I get intubated, uh, this is what needs to happen. And likewise, uh, he was sharing that with me. Uh, so it's a, very, it's a very serious virus that attacks very quickly. Uh, and and to, to us, I think that really solidified uh, the, the impact that that virus would have on us. And it, it shaped uh, the rest of the year for us and how we, how we view things and how we interacted with people, uh, et, et cetera. Right. So, uh, so that's, that's, I guess, a, a, a story of how we realized that this was a really serious, uh, serious global health risk uh, that we were facing, and we needed to take it very, very seriously. Yeah, absolutely. That, that makes a lot of sense. What were the symptoms like for you and your husband? How quickly did they, did they begin to develop? How severe did it get? Um, how long did it, did it take to run its course? Uh, so my husband was asymptomatic. Uh, so thank goodness that I showed symptoms because otherwise uh, he would have not known that he was COVID positive and, and, and his whole office was, was negative. His uh, cleaning staff was negative. We, we had him tested immediately. So that was really a great thing that nobody was infected uh, in that regard. Uh, I developed symptoms uh, uh, associated with COVID. Uh, I had a slight fever. I had a cough, persistent cough uh, that lasted probably at least a month, a month and a half. And then uh, I also uh, I had weakness uh, and fatigue. Uh, it was very, very difficult for me to quarantine at home. Uh, I, I was able to work, continue to work from home uh, doing, obviously everybody was in lockdown during that time frame, uh, and uh, we were certainly in, in home lockdown uh, because uh, we didn't want to expose anybody else to, to the virus. Uh, and and uh, really, those were the, the extent of our symptoms. At some point, I lost my sense of uh, smell. I didn't lose my sense of taste, thank goodness, because I love to eat. Um, and uh, but, but it did make eating, uh, I, I came to realize how much eating depends on the sense of smell as well. Um, and, and it came back, fortunately, it came back uh, probably a week later. Uh, I, was, I gained my sense of smell back and, and things smelled a little bit differently since then. Uh, so things that I would normally eat or, or sense uh, and smell, uh, they just had a different, different smell for a period of time. Things are back to normal now, I think. Um, and then post COVID, after we were in lockdown for uh, 14 days, uh, post COVID, we uh, we both experienced some GI issues, uh, gastro uh, internal issues, uh, intestinal issues that that it was we could not attribute it anything to other than COVID. And then of course we Googled our friend and we looked it up, and certainly many people were reporting se several. GI issues as well, post COVID or during COVID as well. Fortunately, all that and all that has passed, and and uh, and uh, we're both uh, fully fully recovered. Thank goodness. Well, yeah, that's good. I'm happy to hear that. Did you so four, you said 14 days um, that y'all were sort of in this lockdown? You mentioned that this cough you had was persistent for like a month and a half. Um, so how long would you say in total were y'all? very um, sort of in that mode of, okay, we are still in the middle of this. How did you go about just getting basic, you know, supplies, food and things like that to your house? What was uh, that process of, of extreme lockdown like, like for y'all? Uh, 
Well, we were preparing for lockdown. So of course uh, we, we made a run to the, to the grocery store before lockdown to make sure that we were stocked up with canned goods and dry goods to make sure that we would be able to withstand that. Uh, fortunately, uh, we had the means and the resources where we would we would be able to uh, to, to shop online to have uh, fresh food uh, delivered to our house. Uh, uh, major chains made that very easily for us to be able to do that, and we had the of course the resources, the means, because not everybody could can afford to do that. And then of course we had. Uh, friends that were close checking on us, um, making sure that we were okay, making sure that we, we, we had everything that we needed uh, while we were in our house. Uh, and and they, they kept checking up on us uh, on a periodic basis. We had a, a friend that is an infectious disease doctor and uh, he would check on us periodically and told us what to look for, what are the warning signs. Uh, we made sure we had a, a pulse ox, which is a, a pulse oximeter that measures the oxygen levels in your in your blood to make sure that we were staying at, at the safe levels of that because that's how healthy people ended up dying was because they they uh, didn't measure their, their pulse ox levels and by the time they went to the hospital they quickly deteriorated after that uh, so uh, we had a lot of help uh, it's, it's a community effort uh, we didn't let too many people know that we were in uh, we were in in, in COVID quarantine, uh, primarily because uh, we've got elderly parents that we didn't want them to worry, and the news uh, every day was was really how many people are dying based on COVID, so we didn't tell our parents and our family members until after uh, we had recovered from COVID. Would you remind me, please, um, anyone else in your circle, family, close friends um, that uh, got this disease, that got that contracted COVID? Well, during that time, uh, no. Uh, but since that time, uh, we've had uh, we've had employees uh, come come uh, recover through COVID. We've had uh, my sister had COVID um, in in Laredo, Texas. Um, so yeah, we've had family and friends. Uh, fortunately, folks that we know uh, were able to recover from COVID. Uh, so that was a good thing. We were particularly worried with my sister uh, when my sister got COVID because uh, she had a lot of uh, underlying conditions that uh, gave us uh, some very serious concern about her condition. Uh, one time we encouraged her, uh, we, were, we, we send her pulse ox to make sure that she was measuring her pulse ox but then she was getting to the point where she couldn't breathe. So we, we did uh, ask her to go to a clinic uh, to make sure that uh, she was checked out. And with uh, IV fluids, uh, they checked her out and, and, and then, then they released her, so, which was a good thing, but that's what she needed to, re to recover. That's good. Um, so you said that you were going through these difficult conversations um, at the time that y'all contracted this disease. Uh, I imagine that must've been a very frightening time for for both of y'all what if any has been the impact on your mental health over the past year not just from contracting COVID and going to the next, through that experience of worrying about your sister or worrying about your elderly parents but also just the effects of isolation of um uh, of the stay staying at home of, of the lockdowns and um, do you feel as if there's been any impact on your general mental health and if so how, how has that been well, absolutely. I think uh, the isolation, um, the isolation that comes around with uh, with lockdown and with everything that we've gone through has been a particularly a problem. Uh, one thing that I I did commit to do was every single day, I would make a phone call. I, I would have a conversation on the phone with my mom. Sometimes it would be phone. Sometimes it would be video chat. Um, but uh, she particularly was feeling isolation. She's 80 years old now, um, so she's in a, a very vulnerable group of folks that would be severely impacted by COVID. Uh, so that worry and that stress on our families and on our, ourselves uh, was really weighing hard on us, has been weighing hard on us over the past year. Um, it was only, it, COVID was everywhere. Uh, and as a, particularly as the holidays of Approached, uh, and as the holidays subsided, we saw spikes in COVID going uh, higher. 
Uh, so it's, it's it was only a matter of time be, before folks that were close to us would would go through the same uh, situation that we did. And fortunately, uh, many many people did survive. But the the stress of our employees, uh, make, making sure our employees stayed safe, making sure that our family stayed safe uh, and our loved ones stayed safe. Uh, and if they did contract it, uh, worrying about their health, uh, all of that had had a toll on us uh, throughout this whole past year. So it is, it has been, and, and then uh, particularly usually the support mechanisms that we have associated with dealing with those kinds of stressors, uh, really aren't available to us. It's not like we could go uh, and, and talk about it with some friends uh, or, or, or really get together with, with friends and family uh, about that. So it, we had limited options and coping mechanisms associated with the stressors that we were facing during, during COVID. So it made it really, it made it real challenge for us. And there were moments in time where, where we felt um, either foggy or uh, not necessarily focused or uh, or really uh, sort of overwhelmed with with everything that was going on. Uh, so uh, it, it, it was a, a bit of a challenge uh, this entire year. Does your mother live uh, in the same city as you or nearby uh, to where y'all are? No, we are, we are in Atlanta, Georgia, and my mother is in Laredo, Texas. Oh, okay. Have you seen her at all in person since the start of this? Yes. Uh, fortunately, after after we recovered from COVID, uh, we knew that we had some natural immunity, uh, and we were able to visit her uh, to uh, more for her than for us uh, because she she was really uh, she was struggling with uh, being isolated. Uh, she's an 80 year old, but she loves to stay busy. She loves to do her own things and, and she's still working. Uh, so she, she wants, she wanted to be out and about and do things, but she was getting frustrated that she was stuck at home and she couldn't do much because at, dur during those times, uh, the, the COVID rates uh, were increasing in, in, in Laredo significantly. Um, so we went to go see her to check on her uh, fortunately, my sister lives there as well. When we saw her, we didn't stay with her. Uh, when we would, uh, we all wore a mask in her house, opened the windows, turned on the fans. We, I mean, we did everything that we we could to to bring some sense of uh, of of comfort uh, around her and making her feel loved and and connected still with us. So that's that's sort of what we were what we were what we were dealing with. Uh, but we're fortunate that. After we had it, we felt more comfortable uh, to go visit because of the natural immunity that that COVID provided us at that time. Uh, we knew that we had a few months before our natural immunity would subside. So speaking about um, immunity, have you um, or your mother or your sister or your husband um, received a vaccine uh, or are you planning to receive one in the near future? Um, what has that been like for you all? So my uh, my my husband is a pediatrician, so he's a healthcare worker. He was in the first tier for folks to receive the vaccine, and fortunately, he was able to get uh, get both vaccines. Uh, he he got the Pfizer vaccine. Um, I was able to get eleventh uh, dose vaccine um, through Moderna. Uh, essentially, there were extra extra dose one extra dose in in the Moderna vials uh, that I was able. Call, got a call at the last minute, said, uh, are you interested? I said yes, uh, and was quickly able to get the vaccine. My mother has been fully vaccinated. Uh, as soon as Laredo started vaccinating, uh, she was trying to get in line, uh, but the, the line was requiring them to sleep overnight. And my mom's 80 years old. She can't sleep overnight in a car. Uh, she just can't do that. Uh, so fortunately, she went to the local clinic and she was able to, by knocking on the door and getting informed and educated, she, she by her tenaciousness, she was able to get uh, uh, an appointment for a vaccine and then uh, subse subsequently also uh, vaccinated the second time as well. Uh, and my sister just yesterday got her vaccine. She had to travel from Laredo, Texas to Alice, Texas to be able to get the vaccine, but uh, Laredo, uh, there weren't slots available. So she, she went, with her husband to get vaccinated. And then my, 
my other sister in Colorado has gotten uh, vaccinated as well in Colorado. I imagine that's uh, especially for your mom, but also just for, for yourself and your husband and, and your sister. Um, I imagine that's got to feel like a weight has been lifted, right? What does that feel like now that uh, you know that at least, you know, y'all are vaccinated, your mother's vaccinated. What does that feel like for you? Oh, it's really been amazing um, to see the the happiness in my with my mom. Uh, my mom was able to visit her great granddaughter. Uh, my niece just had uh, a, a baby, and it's the first uh, first daughter that my my niece has. Uh, so my mom was extremely happy to be able to hold the baby. Uh, of course, she still wears a ma wears a mask. Uh, but I mean, she's fully vaccinated, so uh, that was perfectly okay for her to do that. Uh, but it's a it's a weight off her shoulders, uh, so she feels more comfortable uh, doing things. She's she's working more now because uh, now she's more comfortable. Her employer also took steps to make her feel safe. Put in a fan, put in plexiglass. Uh, she wears a mask and she wears a face shield when she goes to work. So all those all those steps and precautions. But now that she's been vaccinated. It's, it's much easier uh, as well for, for my mother. And, and really, I think that's the biggest thing that uh, we were particularly worried about uh, was making sure that, that my, my mother was, and, and my, my husband's parents were, were taken care of. And fortunately, they've been also vaccinated as well. So, so now that the vaccine has started rolling out, um, it's really, I think, uh, seeing the light at the end of the tunnel has been a great thing. And rather than uh, still being in limbo of plans of what we need to do for the rest of the year, uh, being unknown, I think we're, we're feeling more comfortable to be able to make plans because uh, people will be vaccinated. So that, that's, that's a great thing. We're planning a surprise for my mother for Mother's Day, where we're going to, my sisters are going to be fully vaccinated by then. Um, and I will be fully, I'm already fully vaccinated. So we're going to be uh, we're going to be meeting with my mom to to make sure it's our first family reunion that we were able to do with it, with us uh, being together in a household without having to wear masks because uh, we're all vaccinated. So that's uh, that's exciting. Yeah, but that's going to feel really good. And um, what what does your mother do? What is what is her job? My mom is an assistant at a driving school, so she basically uh, uh, manages the office and helps. Uh, helps do all the paperwork associated with the driving school in Laredo. Very cool. And um, so I want to ask you, I want to pivot just a little bit, still talking about COVID, but ask you more about um, the, res the response and the impact in your community. Um, so in Atlanta and in Georgia, and specifically just the different, the way that the response has been politicized, if you believe that it has, um, you know, both Governor Kemp and um, Mayor Lance Bottoms became sort of national figures over the past year. And I know that there have been reports of, um, you know, just, just differing approaches to dealing with the pandemic. So your perspective as, uh, you know, as, as a person who's made Georgia, Atlanta, your home, what, how have you seen the response from your local leaders over the past year? What do you think has been successful? What do you think was failing? Um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll just start with that. What are your thoughts on that? I think first, First responsibility lies with uh, then President Trump uh, and his uh, his lack of seriousness uh, to what we were facing at the time. Uh, I think President Trump uh, holds responsibility for for the tens of thousands of deaths that could have been prevented had he taken it seriously and had he followed guidance guidance from his scientists rather than uh, leaning into the politics. So. President Trump holds bears responsibility for many deaths and for the politicization, the politicis, politicis, making it a political situation, uh, in the sense that uh, people on the right uh, don't think it's a serious uh, pandemic, and not wearing masks and not following CDC guidelines, and unfortunately, I mean our governor. In, in Georgia, Governor Kemp uh, followed the, the Trumpism belief of uh, minimizing the impact of uh, the pandemic and what, it, it, what its impact could have on our society. Of course, it's also racialized uh, uh, 
pandemic disproportionately it impacts black and brown communities uh, more heavily black and brown communities are are more frontline workers where we many in our communities couldn't stay home and work from home uh they're frontline workers so they they've been out there and, and being exposed and therefore uh, contracting the disease and dying from the disease a lot more than than in other communities so not only has it been politicized but it's also been racialized uh, by the disparate impact that it's had on our community. So uh, it's been really disheartening to see folks not following guidelines. Uh, and and Georgia has never had a mask mandate. Uh, and for example, um, Mayor Lance Bottoms, Keisha Lance Bottoms, wanted to implement that. Uh, and of course, the governor in his emergency powers that the Georgia legislature gave him, uh, overruled uh, what local communities could do to protect uh, its citi their citizens. So, uh, the really the it, it's been an unfortunate, uh, unfortunate hodgepodge of responses that's been able to happen around the country, where thousands of lives could have been saved had we taken some very basic uh, preventive measures of adhering to social distancing ensuring that everybody wears a mask uh, in, anywhere in public or outside the home uh, would have really saved lots of lives. And unfortunately, that didn't happen uh, because of it started with President Trump and then unfortunately followed with several, uh, several leaders that followed his lead. Uh, knowing that they know better uh, is really the, the worst thing that I think we can think of is that, and history is not going to be kind to to many of the political leaders that followed uh, the Trump line of the pandemic, knowing that they knew better that it was going to hurt people in the long run. When you were, um, you know, out and about, uh, be it shopping or um, something for work, or just whenever you have to go out um, over the course of the past year, do you see a lot of folks without masks? Do you see a lot of folks flaunting since there was no mandate? Since there. Um, was no mandated shutdown either. Um, do you see a lot of people flaunting the guidelines that um, were recommended by CDC, or do most people tend to protect themselves uh, still, despite the lack of leadership uh, from the from uh, your political leaders? What have What have you seen just on the ground? Well, black and brown communities are on our own with regards to leadership from our, our governor. Uh, so uh, we took matters into our own hands and uh, all the organizations that we work with uh, were promoting adherence to the CDC guidelines, making sure that people, we handed out uh, PPE uh, uh, to, to folks. Uh, we were handing out PPE to, to folks that we had in the community as we were promoting the census, as we were registering people to vote, uh, as we were uh, promoting voting in the last election cycle, uh, even uh, some of our groups uh, in Georgia were handing PPE to poultry workers because poultry plants were not providing enough PPE to the workers, even though they were forcing them to work longer, faster, uh, faster line speeds, uh, and 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 more closer together. Uh, they weren't providing them with enough PPE. Uh, so. Uh, Again, black and brown communities are resilient communities. We had to take matters into our own hands to protect ourselves, uh, and we did, despite uh, the lack of leadership and the stupidity of not following science uh, from some of our political leaders. How has the vaccine distribution process been? You mentioned that uh, black and brown communities have suffered disproportionately from this virus. And we've also seen issues with distribution, making sure that these communities get access to the vaccine. What has that been like in your area? I think in Georgia, the, the vaccine distribution was, was horrible at first. Uh, it wasn't, uh, there was no coordination. There was a lot of confusion. It was chaos uh, in, in the beginning. Uh, some of that has subsided. Of course, uh, we're probably several months into uh, vaccine distribution processes. Some of that has subsided and now in Georgia today, uh, 16 and older are eligible. Uh, any, any adult that wants a vaccine is eligible to get a vaccine. Uh, so there's still some issues around that about access uh, and disproportionately, again, the numbers have been 
that those with more resources in wider communities have had greater vaccination rates than, than black and brown communities. Uh, so more steps need to be taken associated, um, looking at it from an equity perspective to ensure that resources are going to, um, to those that need it the most and that are most impacted uh, by the virus. Uh, so ourselves and, and several other groups are gonna be planning on uh, making, uh, on, on calling uh, black and brown communities to make sure that black and brown communities can have access to vaccines, that ha can have access to appointment sessions uh, that we're going to be doing. So we're, we're organizing, making sure that, uh, again, we're taking the lead. We're not relying on our, our, our government to, to take the lead uh, because they're, they're failing at that job. So we're taking the lead to make sure that our communities have access and, and we can overcome any technological uh, obstacles that people have associated with that. So we're we're in the midst of planning uh, a, a rollout of a of a phone calling campaign where we're going to call people that we know are more likely to have less access and make sure that they do have access. That's a good uh, segue because I want to ask you about uh, your work with Galeo and, and the different uh, projects that you're involved in. But before I I get to that. It's interesting in our pre-interview, you had said that you had worked as an engineer, um, that you had, that's what you had originally studied before pivoting and working with uh, Maldef. Uh, so I'm just wondering what, that seems like a pretty extreme pivot. What led you to uh, leave the world of engineering uh, and enter policy and specifically working with Latino communities as an advocate? So I was I was raised in a in a single mother household, um, and uh, we dealt with a lot of challenges when my sisters were growing up. Uh, and given the statistics, I, I really have been blessed to have the opportunities that I've had of being able to go to college to get a degree. Um, so with that comes a heavy responsibility to give back to the community. Uh, to make sure that uh, I ensure that we need to look out for opportunities and create opportunities for our community. So policy was a great connection for me for that. Uh, yes, I was able to get a uh, an engineering degree and I, I had a tremendous, uh, tremendous experience working as a, as a professional engineer, uh, make, working on industrial automation projects all over the country. Uh, and I did, I, I did great work associated with that, but I kept having a, 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 a pull back to having more contact with community. Uh, I like people more than I like machines. So that was the other piece of that is uh, I was wanting to make sure that I had, I continued uh, to, to develop and uh, cultivate uh, human relationships. Uh, so it was, it, was, it was a matter of time before that was going to pull me even further. Uh, and, that, and that's where I, I think I've been able to be be a best use of what my skill sets bring um, to to the table to where I'm I'm fully utilizing uh, the God given talents that I have to serve. Uh, so I felt that uh, that's that that was my life's calling, and I'm glad I made that shift. So uh, tell us please about about Galileo, about the founding, about your work. It's been a, a long time, nearly two decades that you've been with uh, Galileo. So Take us back, if you would please, to the beginning of that uh, initiative. Sure. Well, we started Galeo in 2003, and that was after a, a brutal uh, legislative session in the Georgia legislature. At that time, uh, we had just elected the first three Latino Georgia legislators in, in Georgia's history. Uh, one state senator, one state, uh, two state representatives, one of which was uh, Republican, one of which was a Democrat. So the two Democrats and I worked very closely together. I, at the time, I was working uh, with Maldif, um, and we were working very closely on legislation to push for expansion of access to driver's licenses without uh, regarding immigration status. Uh, and we were pitching that from an economic development perspective. Uh, we want people to come to Georgia. We want people to feel comfortable coming to Georgia. We want people to be able to uh, conduct business in Georgia. We want uh, making sure that people have access to 
uh, identification and are able to drive safely and are held accountable when they're driving on the streets and has access to insurance. So all those things came to play. Uh, we, we passed it out of the Georgia Senate on day one. Uh, when we brought it to the, to the Senate floor, it was recalled and voted down the next day. So since that time, that was sort of the catalyst of saying, well, what went wrong and, and what do we need to do differently? Uh, so the two uh, Democratic uh, legislators and I got together and we, we were driving to a, a town hall meeting uh, in about an hour and a half away from the metro Atlanta area in Athens, Georgia, where we were going to uh, face an immigrant, uh, immigrant community. And they wanted to know they heard that we were getting licenses and now they were not getting licenses. So what happened? Uh, so in that, in that uh, drive there and after our town hall meeting with our immigrant community, what we realized was that part of the, part of the challenge was that the Latino community was not involved in the legislative political process. Uh, so we said we, we thought we needed to create a, a, an organization, a nonpartisan organization to be a catalyst for uh, civic engagement and leadership development of the Latino community in Georgia. And really that was the birth of uh, what led to the creation of Galeo and all the great work that we've done since then. So what um, then, and, and maybe it's evolved since then, but what uh, have been some of the barriers that keep Latino communities in Georgia or, or, and or immigrant communities from becoming involved in, their, in the process, as you say, from being civically engaged? And what strategies have you all found effective for, uh, for getting past those barriers? So I think uh, to understand that, uh, I think I need to lay a little bit of context associated with that. So first, uh, I think the population demographic breakdown, it would, would paint a, a better picture, a big picture of sort of where we are. So in Georgia, it's estimated as of the 2010 census, it's estimated that we have about a million Latinos in the state of Georgia out of a population of about 9 million. Uh, so that's a significant uh, amount of uh, population that we have. But more than half of the Latino population is foreign born and more than half of the foreign born population is undocumented. So electoral power is something that uh, is still lagging uh, from, from, from the Latino community in that perspective. When we started as an organization, there were only 10,000 Latinos registered to vote in the state in 2003. And now uh, the number is well over 385,000 uh, Latinos are registered to vote. Uh, the Latino voter participation rate in Georgia in presidential cycles has been uh, beating the national Latino voter participation rate for several election cycles already. Uh, so Latinos uh, have been growing in number in, in electorally and have been uh, punching above their weight class associated when compared to the national Latino voter participation rate for, for several years. So when we, in the 2020 election, when Latinos were turning out in record numbers, uh, based on the 2016 election compared to the 2020 election, Latinos uh, increased uh, voter participation by 70%, uh, which is astounding. Uh, so Latinos clearly uh, had, uh, uh, had an impact in the outcome of the election that we had here in Georgia. That was the general election, but also in the runoff election. Uh, again, Latinos were paying attention to what was at stake. Latinos were involved, were listening. And now at 385,000, uh, with, mar with slim margins that we had, uh, uh, President Biden won Georgia by 12,000 votes. So uh, I, Latino community certainly had a, a significant impact with that polling for uh, President Biden in Georgia in the, in the campaign uh, season was 70% of the Latino community was supporting uh, the Biden campaign. So there is a significant impact that the Latino community has had. So what have been the tactics and strategies that we've had over the years? Well, one, we've, we have a very robust leadership development program to ensure that we develop a pipeline of engaged uh, and politi politically astute uh, Latino leaders uh, that are uh, equipped with the basic skills to be able to do more in our communities. Uh, and so that's the one, the first pillar of work that we do. 
A uh, second pillar that we do is again, uh, so they're informed and educated and they have the skills. Now, how do we turn that into political power? Uh, at the Capitol, when we were lobbying uh, for pro-immigrant legislation or an against anti-immigrant legislation, uh, I had legislators tell me, who cares about the Latino community? Uh, they don't, they, they're not registered to vote and they don't show up to vote when they are registered to vote. So why should I care about Latino issues? So that resonated and, and that's why uh, the other piece of the work that we did was make sure that the Latino community was number one registered, number two showed up to vote. Uh, those that were eligible to become citizens became citizens. Latinos, we encourage participation in the census, the 2010 census and the 2020 census, which we'll see numbers soon, but also uh, making sure that their voices were heard and we trained folks on how to be able to express themselves to elected officials to make their case, not necessarily telling them what to do, but make their case about how specific legislation would impact their lives. And uh, our community, our community is, 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 has tremendous talent and, and are great storytellers. So uh, given the opportunity, our, our community has been able to change hearts because of the stories that they've told. So because of that, uh, we've, been, uh, we've been paying attention at the Georgia legislature for many years, but over the last several years, we were able to beat back, even though there was uh, Republican, heavy Republican control of the Georgia legislature, we were able to beat back uh, all the anti-immigrant initiatives that were being proposed in the last several years. This year, there was a proposal to, to mark licenses. There was a, uh, we defeated that. There was a proposal that uh, got heard in a hearing and passed out of a hearing uh, to expand access to uh, in-state tuition to some uh, DACA folks. Uh, it was very limited. It's limited in the scope of what we want, but it, at least it, was, it, was, it, it made strides in a positive direction. So those are some of the examples that, that have happened. And none of that would have happened if number one, we didn't have an engaged Latino electorate. And number two, we didn't have talented Latinos being able to tell their stories and tell the stories of our community uh, add two legislators and policymakers to make sure that our voices are heard and respected in the in the Georgia Gold Dome. It's interesting you mentioned so being in the minority party um, in the Georgia legislature. Um, I'm wondering if on these issues that are specifically um, that specifically impact the Latino community, the immigrant community, if you've been able to find Republican support, especially among Republican Latinos, you mentioned at the when you're talking about uh, the founding of Galeo that you're working primarily with primarily with Democrats, um, but there had been a Republican Latino elected. We actually, interestingly enough, we inter we interviewed uh, David Casas for this uh, project a, a while back as well. Um, but so I'm wondering what you know. There's there's a lot of um, there's you know a lot of uh, information and, and different analysis out there on you know what can unite Latinos even on opposite sides of the aisles. Have you found that you get Republican allies um, who are Latino when you're talking about these issues that are specifically oriented at uh, y'all's community? So uh, with regards to David Casas, let's start there. Representative David Casas, unfortunately, uh, was a legislator that, that worked against our community. Uh, he was proposing initiatives to ban access to K through 12 education to Latino students that were undocumented. Uh, so it's hard to start uh, a conversation uh, about working collaboratively when you have sort of a mentality that a uh, certain segment of the population is not worthy for something as basic that's protected by Supreme Court ruling as K through 12 education. And him being an educator was really uh, astounding to, to have that. Uh, Galeo has had numerous Republican, uh, both elected officials and Republican uh, members as part of our board. Uh, and uh, they've certainly supported uh, the efforts of a compassionate conservatism approach that President Bush brought uh, to the immigration debate. Uh, so unfortunately, the Latino Republicans that we have at this time 
have have drank the Trump Kool Aid, uh, and unfortunately don't necessarily see our community in the in the light that benefits our community. Uh, we just started a C4 organization um, in 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 the past year, and unfortunately, I mean, we we did our very first endorsements in in, in this past election cycle. Uh, so we endorsed uh, Representative Zulma Lopez, who's now serving in the Georgia legislature. We endorsed the first Latina district attorney that's serving in the Athens Oconee area's district attorney, uh, Deborah Gonzalez. We endorsed an African American Democratic sheriff uh, uh, in, in Cobb County because he was promising to end the 287G agreement and beat an incumbent, uh, the, the, the incumbent sheriff uh, beat him. Uh, because of that position on against 287G. In Gwinnett County, a similar situation was developing where there was an African-American uh, Democratic uh, candidate uh, going against the deputy sheriff who was endorsed by the retiring sheriff. Uh, and that deputy sheriff was a Latino, uh, Mexican uh, descent Latino, Luz Solis. And we had to be clear, we, we were uncomfortable endorsing the Democratic candidate because there were some questions about other criminal justice issues that we were working in coalition with other groups about, uh, that he wasn't providing us clear answers, but we were very clear about opposing the Republican candidate, uh, Lou Solis, because of his positions of continuing the 287G agreement. So we felt it real strongly that just because a person is Latino doesn't necessarily mean that it reflects being Latino doesn't mean it, you reflect the values of the community uh, in, in general. So in Georgia, about two thirds of the, the Latino population is of Mexican descent. Uh, and, and, so, and then the next uh, demographic is, is Puerto Rican. So that sort of gives you sort of the, uh, if you look at the national trends, uh, that that's, will sort of give you the political affiliation of what we have uh, with most Latinos in Georgia. So. We're here, uh, we want to be, we are a nonpartisan organization and we'll continue to be, but that doesn't mean that just because a person is Latino, well, they'll get an automatic pass uh, to, to have a good relationship with our community. No, uh, having a good relationship with our community is standing up for the values. Uh, the values of the Latino community are making sure that our immigrant brothers and sisters are protected, making sure that voting rights uh, are, are more accessible. Voting is more accessible rather than less accessible. Uh, so those are the two primary things that we've been focusing on from a policy perspective. And either uh, there's Latinos that re reflect those values and there's Latinos that don't reflect those values. Uh, and similarly to, to non-Latinos too. Uh, so we need to make sure that we, we are here representing the values of the Latino community. And sometimes the Latinos, uh, in the Republican Party, don't necessarily have the same uh, the same alignment of values associated with that. They align with the party before they align with with community. So uh, to, to pivot a little bit, bring back to a point that you had mentioned that I don't want to uh, forget about. You talked about the census and the fact that this past year was a census year, and and y'all were involved in that work. I would imagine that in a typical census year, there's a lot of knocking on doors. There's a lot of being out in the community. Um, just like in a typical election year, um, what was it like for y'all to pivot what I imagine had been planning for um, for the census, uh, undertaking that census? Um, and what did y'all find to be effective in engaging with communities that are um, nationwide, you know, notoriously have been difficult to count for a lot of different reasons? What was effective for y'all in, in reaching out to these communities during the pandemic? Yeah, so uh, in the beginning of 2020, we had nearly doubled our staff to uh, to realize the, the what was at stake in 2020 for our communities. We had the 2020 census, we had the 2020 election cycle, and those were really pivotal moments for our communities that that we had to step into and, and invest resources to ensure that we were doing everything that we could that our community participated in in both of those. Uh, so when COVID hit, uh, we had to pivot to working remotely. And uh, obviously normally we would be in community, we would be door to door, we would be at the, at the 
at the taquerias, we would be at the mercados, we would be at the flea markets. Uh, we would be everywhere where our community would be, but unfortunately that was impossible with the pandemic. Uh, we had to respect the science. We had to make sure that we were socially distanced. So we pivoted to do a lot of virtual uh, outreach to our community. We also had to be smart and strategic about what we were targeting. Uh, so obviously mainstream Latinos were gonna be hit with mainstream messaging uh, around uh, participating in the census. We had to target per Spanish dominant uh, Latinos that really needed the, the message uh, to ensure that they, they felt secure and safe about participating in the census. And so we pivoted a lot of our messaging was primarily targeted in Spanish and then that, that's really what we did. We formed a uh, Latino Complete Count Committee and that was co-chaired with the Latino Community Fund of Georgia. And we had well over 38 organizations, governments and entities that were doing outreach to the Latino community participate in a in, in collaborative effort of outreach uh, to the Latino community. And everybody was facing the same thing that we were facing a lot of the pivot that had to happen to virtual. So we were doing phone banking, text banking, we were sending out mailers to low response uh, zip codes uh, uh, that were heavily Latino dense. Uh, so we, we were doing everything that we could and we partnered very strongly uh, with Spanish media to do a combination of earned media, a, a public service announcement media and even paid media at times to ensure that the message of participation was hitting the community that it most needed to hit. Uh, Spanish radio and Spanish print media were also integral to that to that outreach. So there, it was a combination of that. And uh, the average Latino in Georgia happens to be uh, millennial and younger. So we knew that social media was going to have to be an integral part of uh, all of the work that we did. So we were very heavily uh, prominent on, uh, of course, Facebook, Instagram, uh, we even uh, created a TikTok to begin our, our outreach efforts and make sure that we were reaching all levels in our community uh, because we know in, in Latino households, uh, the younger generation tend to uh, be there for the older generation too, to make sure that there's translation, make sure that they know uh, what's, what's going on in our community. And that there's a lot of intergenerational uh, support among Latino households. So we were we were tackling it from all from all angles. Has there been any way for you to measure, um, I guess, the, the success of that campaign of how many, how, how high the participation rate was in the census in these communities? So uh, one thing that I forgot to mention, uh, the other pivot that we had with regards to uh, during the pandemic and participation in the census, uh, obviously the pandemic had and it impacted uh, predominantly black and brown communities heavily as well from an economic perspective. Uh, so uh, we, we did things that we don't normally do. We were helping at food pantries uh, in food delivery. And in us helping with the food delivery, we were putting census information and uh, making sure that we were uh, linking that food delivery with census information and making sure that people uh, had information about the census and participating about the census in the food pantry. We were distributing PPE to poultry workers. In the distribution of PPE, we were also distributing information in those packets uh, about participating in the census. What, success, what preliminary indicators of success do we have? Well, in the counties that we were doing the most work, uh, the participation rates in those counties surpassed the participation rate as a state. Uh, so from that perspective, we think that uh, we, we had great success. Uh, certainly, I think that there was a lot of confusion about the census, uh, moving timelines, citizenship question, uh, the rhetoric coming from, from, from the, the Trump administration as well created a lot of confusion about uh, participation in the census. But overall, I think that we're going to be surprised. Georgia is really going to be on a map nationally of the, the total number of Latinos that are going to, that really are here. And we're going to see uh, a tremendous growth of the Latino community in Georgia. Are you expecting Georgia to gain uh, representatives at the national level? Is that the expectation? 
No, the, the expectation is not to gain uh, representatives. I don't think uh, we won't know till we will we see the census numbers. But uh, ultimately, I think uh, it's to hold steady uh, from uh, with regards to the number of delegation that we will have based out of Georgia. Uh, and certainly, uh, we're ready and, and willing to. We're we're preparing to engage in the redistricting process to make sure that our community is respected in that process. Um, not just our community from a Latino perspective, but across race and ethnicity, we are working with uh, African American civil rights groups and Asian American civil rights groups to make sure that we will be creating unity maps to ensure that power is based in community and not in politicians. So we're gonna be working across race and ethnicity to, cons to, cons to continue to consolidate uh, community-based power. So uh, to switch again a little bit and talk about the election specifically. So on both the C3 and the C4 side of, of y'all's organization, what messaging did you find was particularly effective uh, again, with these communities that we're talking about, be it just to increase participation or to endorse for a specific candidate, or were sort of the things that y'all were hammering home uh, over the course of the year? So uh, most of the work that we did uh, occurred under the C3 uh, banner, uh, because that's really, uh, the, the C4 was just getting off the ground, and we were uh, working on that. Most of the work that we did on the C4 was uh, primarily after uh, after the, the Georgia general election runoff where we had the two U.S. Senate seats. Um, so I'll focus more on my comments on, on what we did uh, with regards to messaging on the C3 side, particularly for the runoff election that carried through to the general election. So it, for the C3, our, we, we had a really simple, uh, simple slogan, luchar, votar, poder. Uh, we had to fight for our community uh, we have to vote in our community, and we're going to realize our power as a community uh, was really the messaging. And we tied all of our messaging around those three elements. Uh, the Latino community had suffered tremendously under the Trump administration. So many in the Latino community knew what was at stake uh, around uh, the election, particularly in the presidential cycle with uh, the Trump uh, administration carrying a very anti-Latino, anti-immigrant, white nationalist type of rhetoric and campaign against Latinos, uh, the messaging was, was pretty clear. Uh, as a community, we needed to come together to make sure that we stood up to white nationalist type of thinking, uh, white supremacy type of rhetoric that was uh, targeting our, our community um, and, and not recognizing and respecting our contributions to this state. So the, the messaging was really strong about, uh, it was C3 messaging focused on ensuring that we as a community recognized uh, the power, the potential of our power that we had. Uh, and as I mentioned, I think uh, the Latino community and particularly in Georgia had been uh, performing the national Latino voter participation rate. So in the 2020 election, it was poised to truly have a significant impact. And I think that Latinos, truly did have a significant impact in Georgia. So the messaging was working. It resonated with our community. We did several uh, uh, videos for online, for uh, Spanish media. We were targeting, of course, Spanish dominant uh, voters because those are the ones that needed the most help. Uh, our state, uh, only one county in the entire state out of 159 counties provides information in English and Spanish. Uh, so we had to provide that information in English and Spanish to our community because the demographics dictated that uh, many in our community needed uh, assistance and education about the different options and how to vote, uh, particularly in Spanish. So uh, we were serving as that resource for our community, and we think that that resource uh, did help in, 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 in the outcome that we had of uh, tremendous uh, Latino voter participation in the 2020 election cycle. So from, from that perspective, that was what was essential. On the C4 side, we did set up a C4 PAC as well. That was essentially many Latinos voters did know that there was a runoff, but they didn't know who the candidates were. Uh, so we highlighted uh, the Democratic candidates that were, uh, of course, supportive of uh, comprehensive immigration reform, supportive of voting rights. And in particular, in our community, the other message around COVID response. Uh, 
uh, both from a health perspective and, and the horrendous uh, response that we had uh, from the Trump administration and our governor uh, with from a health perspective, but also the economic perspective and the COVID relief package that just passed uh, the U.S. Senate and is hitting homes uh, now with, uh, with stimulus checks, uh, none of that would have been possible without the Latino community and uh, winning in the U.S. Uh, Senate seats that we had uh, to send to, to the Congress uh, to provide COVID relief. Uh, so COVID relief was a big, uh, was a big uh, messaging uh, that we had also uh, with regards to our community. We knew our community was suffering. We needed something different. We needed something uh, a more uh, science-based response to uh, COVID that would help protect our community. Uh, and that, that was the messaging that we were using uh, during this election cycle. You, uh, you mentioned the rhetoric of, uh, of President Trump and the damages suffered by the Latino community during his administration. Um, still, it's been, interesting, it, it's been interesting to see the analysis of the election since it took place about Latino support for Trump um, supposedly on the rise in some areas, um, although you know it depends on uh, how how relevant that is. Depends on you know what you're reading. But there in Georgia, um, what was the sort of the the, the uh, I guess the spectrum of turn or what was the weight, the percentages, and and what do you think you know just from your position as someone who uh, identifies with the Democrat Party, what do you think was successful? in the Republican messaging that, that uh, won over Latino voters, what do you think you know, is attractive about the messaging or their policies or, or, or whatever, um, just from what you've seen uh, there on the ground? So uh, to be clear, uh, Galeos and the Galeo Impact Fund are both nonpartisan organizations. So uh, yes, uh, from, from regard, with regards to immigration reform, from regards to voting rights, issues, unfortunately, uh, both of those issues, the Republican Party doesn't have a good history in, in supporting immigrant rights or supporting voting rights, expanding voting rights access. So uh, that's the unfortunate, uh, we're, we're based on the values that the Latino community has and uh, the policy impact that uh, we need to realize to ensure that our communities are protected. Um, so I'll just make that clear. Uh, with regards to uh, what was resonating uh, in, in the Latino community, the, as, I, as I mentioned, Latino decisions polling indicated uh, that was the only polling that was done in Georgia uh, targeted to the Latino community. And over 70% of the Latino community that was polled in Georgia was favoring the Biden campaign. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave that there for Latino decisions. Uh, and, and that was the best polling that, that's been done nationally as well. There were pockets of support and increasing support uh, for the Trump uh, campaign um, in, in several areas of, uh, around the country. I think those were, those were isolated areas that were over, over, irresponsibly overblown by national media that really didn't do a lot of digging as to why uh, that resonated with some particularly Latinos. Interesting article that I read recently uh, in the Washington Post was about uh, the allure of uh, the Trump campaign to particularly more uh, Latino males uh, in, in that regard. Uh, and again, that had to do with the messaging around the economy, the messaging uh, around what the Trump campaign was alluding to from social, the scares of socialism, uh, so I think some of that was enough to chip away uh, in, in some parts of the country and even some parts in Georgia uh, about uh, uh, moving towards the Trump campaign versus the uh, Biden campaign. Uh, so I think, uh, and then part of it is also that the parties had not invested significantly, both the Democrat and the Republican Party had not significantly invested in outreach to the Latino community in Georgia. Uh, so that's that's the big that's the big challenge. Now we're seeing movement in both parties in outreach to the Latino community because again, at 385,000 strong, uh, that's a significant uh, block of voters that can determine the outcome of very competitive races. Uh, when uh, Romney won Georgia, that was 300,000 votes. 
Trump won Georgia, that was 200,000 votes. Biden won Georgia, that was 12,000 votes. So the margins have been getting smaller in Georgia and, and Georgia's become uh, certainly now a battleground state uh, for 2022 and 2024. Uh, and the Latino community is at the center of all that. Uh, because yes, there are some Latinos that, that are conservative, but uh, the majority of Latinos certainly uh, listen to the rhetoric coming from the Republican side and, and really side with the Democratic Party based on the polling that has been indicated. So that's, that's just the reality that we see here on the ground. And we see uh, a Republican Latino running for sheriff in Gwinnett County um, losing. Uh, because his position on immigration enforcement is counter to the values of the Latino community that he is he was purporting to try to serve in his candidacy. So I think that there's there's a lot of lessons to be learned uh, around uh, the nuances around outreach uh, from both parties and what the messaging needs to be uh, to to make sure that the Latino community is attracted. The average Latino voter in Georgia is a millennial. So that's the other the, the other element of that is that and the growth in the Latino community and the electorate in Georgia is of younger people, younger than Gen X uh, folks. That's where the growth is. So uh, I think that that's where the messaging needs to be tailored. And, and what we saw in the Georgia legislature just yesterday, uh, passing an, a Jim Crow 2.0 anti and anti well a voter suppression bill. Uh, that the governor uh, rapidly signed into law, tar surgically targeting minority and poor communities uh, to make it more difficult to vote. So instead of sharpening their policy and, and, and ensuring that the policy proposals that the Republican Party has to attract more minority and younger voters, uh, they're just going to make it more difficult for younger minority voters to vote. Uh, uh, so that I, th I think that we're we're seeing a really uh, crossroads in in American democracy right now with what's going on uh, locally. Can you talk more about that that bill that was uh, signed into law yesterday? And so some of the elements that you think are particularly important to have in mind, and what that means for y'all's work. I mean, here over the next couple of years, we're into it. 2022 gubernatorial race, like well, how are we all going to respond to the reality that this legislation is passed and it's going to make your work more difficult? Well, what is that going to look like? So, sorry, first, can you talk about the legislation and then talk about your response? Sure. Uh, so, the legislation uh, is SB 202, and I'll cover most of it. The most egregious thing that I think they that was passed and signed into law yesterday is that the state legislature, the state will have control to take over local elections boards. The state also is mandating how, how quickly local election boards need to certify their elections. Again, in rural parts of the state, uh, smaller populations, uh, meeting those deadlines is not that much of a problem. But in, in, in more urban areas of the state where there's higher density of minority voters, uh, that's going to be a problem uh, in, in meeting some of those uh, some of those deadlines. So that's those are a few a few things. Uh, moving drop boxes from outside locations to inside locations and only allowing access during regular business hours really el eliminates the, the the effectiveness of a drop box because a drop box was available 24 hours outside. Uh, it was being under video surveillance. That was one of the requirements of the drop box. And in a pandemic, that was really a great tool where people would be able to safely uh, be able to drop their votes in, in, in uh, a drop box. Uh, given the problems that we had with the postal service, that was really a lot of, a, a very serious avenue in which people did utilize at the, the use of drop boxes. If you look at the, the racial analysis of previous election cycles and this election cycle, the vote by mail absentee vote process was heavily utilized by minority communities. Uh, so the, the, the Republican leadership in the Georgia legislature wasn't by happenstance tightening it up to make it more difficult. They, they realized that minority communities were utilizing that. They realized that minority communities weren't, uh, weren't 
being swayed with their policy proposals. Rather than changing their policy proposals, they just made it harder for minority communities to vote in, in the instances of drop boxes, in the instances of absentee balloting. Uh, you have to provide a photo ID when you seek uh, a, a, an absentee ballot application. And then when you get the ballot, you also have to provide a photo ID. So what does that mean? That means you have to have access to a copier. You have to, you're gonna have to make uh, in one election cycle, seven to eight copies of your photo ID, which may make you vulnerable for identity theft. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, a lot of problems with the 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 thinking around. In, it, it, again, they're trying to make the election more secure. They're saying they were trying to to deal with election integrity. Well, integrity is about speaking the truth. Is about seeing clarity with with fact rather than myth. Uh, the legislation that was signed into law perpetuates the big lie about election fraud around the country. Uh, election officials have the responsibility to tell the truth. Just because voters believe one way, even though it's based on false narratives and, and a myth, doesn't mean that you're going to legislate based on an, a false narrative or a myth or a lie. Uh, elected officials have a responsibility to tell the truth based on facts. Uh, and that's part of the problem that we have is that they they're perpetuating the big lie that Trump uh, pushed during the campaign season that led to the bloody uh, takeover of the U.S. Capitol that we had. So this is further perpetuating that lie uh, that there was something wrong with the election uh, that they needed to fix. Uh, and, and really and truly, it doesn't fix those situations. So there are other parts of the legislation that that are, are problematic, but those are some of the some of the ones that really uh, strike strike a nerve. I think uh, again, elected officials have a responsibility to tell the truth, have a responsibility to pass policy based on facts, and none of that is is what happened with SB 202, the Jim Crow 2.0 legislation that was signed by Governor Kemp just yesterday. And so now looking ahead, you know, over the next couple of years, what so that, you know, the lack of drop boxes, the, um, the, the, the voter ID requirement, the ID requirements. Um, it's also, you know, that uh, I saw that you could people can no longer engage with voters who are waiting and hand food and water and things like that. So all these restrictions that are being placed on what an organization like yours can do to um, encourage civic engagement, what I imagine y'all are already, you know, thinking about how to respond and, and how you're going to need to uh, react over the next couple of years. What, what is what is on your mind with regards to that? So despite the efforts of the, the Georgia leadership uh, right now, uh, Jim Crow 2.0 is not going to stand. Uh, our communities are resilient. Our communities are resourceful. And our communities are uh, our communities really respond when they feel their vote is trying to be stolen um, and prevented from being exercised. Uh, our communities are going to respond in and vote in ways that we've never seen before. Uh, part of our role and our responsibility is going to be to ensure that we can facilitate. Uh, the continued engagement of our communities uh, across race and across ethnicity to ensure that they know all the gauntlet of barriers that the Republican leadership has put in front of them to, uh, to be able to make sure that they can circumvent a lot of those barriers from voting uh, and make sure that they know all of their options and how they need to dot their I's and cross their T's about having a vote cast that will be counted in, in the elections process. So there's a lot of work that, that has been added to us. Uh, but again, Jim Crow 2.0, uh, Senate Bill 2, 202 uh, is not going to stand because our communities uh, are going to respond in ways that we've not seen before. And they're going to vote in, in larger numbers despite the barriers that, uh, that are being put in front of them. Again, Georgia has been known as a voter suppression state for many, many years. In 2020, we had Georgia being a voter suppression state. We had long lines during the primary process. We're dealing with a global pandemic. 
despite all of that, our communities showed up in record numbers and voted. Uh, so Jim Crow 2.0 is not going to stand, and uh, we're going to work to make sure that we educate, inform our community, and engage them to ensure that they can cast uh, uh, their rights, uh, cast their votes freely and fairly. Uh, you mentioned a, w a little bit ago the events of January 6th, and I, I wanted to ask you, you know, as someone who uh, clearly is dedicating uh, a, a large part of your life or professional life, um, to the democratic process, to having communities engage in politics in this country, to uh, expanding um, just just what that process means. What was it like for you? Because you know that's that's going to be a very important date uh, in history, obviously. And and this interview may be seen, you know, very very far down the line. So as someone who lived that moment, who saw it, I, I assume watched it happen as it happened throughout the day. Can you just tell us what that was like for you, what your thoughts were, what was going through your head, and what you think that the ramifications of, of a day like that are for this country? I think that history is not going to be kind to President Trump. President Trump incited uh, an attempt to overthrow our government and to overthrow our democracy and in, in, uh, and Despite all his efforts, uh, I think that that's really going to be something that uh, there's going to be further ramifications that uh, accountability that need to be held uh, with regards to uh, criminal violations of law that no longer protect the president because he's no longer in office. Um, he was leading uh, the riot, the deadly riot that happened with the uh, attack on our capital. What we saw was white supremacy rearing its ugly head and, and, and really not accepting the will of the American people and trying to subvert the will of the American people for a different direction. Uh, the American people voted and their votes mattered and the election was the most secure, was the most efficient uh, because we had all the options uh, to vote in, in many places that, and there was record participation across the country. Um, so again, I think it's, it's it, history uh, will judge President Trump harshly for his, uh, insidious role in uh, inciting the riot at the Capitol. And all of his enablers in Congress are also not going to be seen favorably uh, because of their continued uh, enabling of that dangerous rhetoric that led to that moment. The senators and the representatives that enabled Trump uh, were put in danger uh, by the president. Their lives were in danger uh, on January 6th. Uh, had it not been for uh, courageous actions that many, uh, many Capitol Police did do in, in trying to uh, protect our, our congressional processes and protect our democracy of the Electoral College votes being certified that day. Uh, so I think that, that history is not going to be kind to Republican enablers of the president. Uh, and then again, to legislatures across the country that are pushing the big lie and trying to fix uh, an electoral system that was not broken in 2020 uh, by passing restrictive Jim Crow 2.0 type of legislation, uh, history is not gonna be kind. Uh, it was really gut-wrenching to experience the, the, the jubilee that happened in Georgia uh, when uh, Georgia was called for Biden. There was, there was, there was celebrations in the streets of, of Atlanta. They had to shut down streets all over Atlanta because of the jubilation there. And then January 5th was the election uh, in Georgia, the runoff election, where for the first time we have an African-American U.S. Senator from the state of Georgia, coupled with the first 
Jewish uh, U.S. senator from the state of Georgia in the South, really. And, and then the next day, we had, our, as a nation, we had the gut punched out of us uh, because of the insidious attempt by the then current President uh, Trump uh, in the excitement of the, of the, of the deadly riot uh, that, that rocked this nation and really came close to harming our institution of the democracy uh, for our state. Uh, luckily, the Supreme Court, the federal courts, uh, had, didn't want anything to do with it. There was no proof that they provided of any kind of fraud or, or questionable behaviors. So yeah, I think uh, uh, I think history is going to judge uh, the Trump administration, the enablers in Congress, the enablers in in the Georgia legislature that are perpetuating the Jim Jim Crow 2.0 type of restrictive legislation, and all across the country, uh, that that's history is not going to be kind uh, to them. Um, well, I, I really just have one more question for you, Jerry, and it's um, you know, looking ahead to the future. You know, so we're this is March 2021. Um, like you've said, legislatures across the country are uh, trying to make it more difficult to vote. Um, the Senate is evenly divided. Vaccines are happening. Communities are getting vaccinated. It's uh, Biden hopes that by May, um, you know, every adult in the country will be vaccinated. And, and you know, the, the the world keeps moving, right? We'll have another election here in a couple of years. Another election four years after that. Latino communities across the uh, country are, are continuing to grow. What are you looking to in the future? Are you optimistic uh, about not just two years, four years, but 10 years down the line there in Atlanta, in Georgia, especially with these Latino communities, these millennials that you're talking about, this young community? What are you looking to, to um, build power to continue uh, the work that you've been doing for, for uh, many years now? And, and just are you optimistic about, about the state of things? Absolutely, I'm optimistic. Despite all of the challenges that we're facing, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very optimistic about the future of our country. Uh, um, in my role in the work that I do at Galeo, I get to work with a lot of young people. Uh, I get to work with a lot of millennials. I get to work with a lot of Gen Z. Uh, seeing their visions of and, 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 and hopes, aspirations and hopes for the future uh, is really uh, inspiring to me. Seeing the talent and the skills and the passion that they bring uh, to the table and rolling up their sleeves and getting ready to do the hard work to build community, to build community for power centered in community is really inspiring working across race and ethnicity in the state uh, has really been, uh, I think the culmination of the work that we've been doing over a past decade resulted in what we saw with record-breaking turnout of minority communities and young people in the 2020 election cycle and in the runoff. So all of those are indicators of hope. Um, yes, there's backlash that we had to deal with uh, when there are, are, are things like that that happen that shock the system. There is gonna be backlash, but our communities are resilient. Our communities are innovative. Our communities are resourceful. And our communities have, have a saying called, si se puede. Uh, so in, in all of that, I find a lot of hope uh, and, and inspiration to a brighter future where, uh, all of us are living uh, and being respected for the contributions that we bring uh, to society. And everybody has equal opportunity to success and life, a pursuit of, uh, of life of happiness uh, as well. So uh, I think that there is a lot of inspiration and hope that, that we can bring. Uh, the road is long. The arc of justice bends. Uh, bends long and we're continuing to bend it towards justice. Uh, so we, we just got to continue to make sure that we do the work necessary to uh, live into that reality. Well, uh, Jerry, thank you so much for your time today. It's been a real pleasure speaking to you and just getting to hear your perspective and, and some of your experiences. 
uh, it should be very valuable for the center and uh, and just the research that's, that's going to be done on this time. So thank you very much. Okay, no problem. If there's anything else you need, Evan, uh, let me know. All right, we'll do. Thank you, Jerry. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.